Good Wednesday afternoon. It is September 6. Big updates here on the intensity and the recent developments that's been going on with Hurricane Irma. Still a major Category 5. Very little change in intensity. In fact, the winds have sustained themselves in excess of 185 miles sustained for over 24 hours now longer than any other hurricane on record in the Atlantic. This storm means business with gusts upwards of 225 miles per hour. There have been some major adjustments to the forecast track. Yesterday we were talking about how the trend was pushing this off towards the west, maybe along the western coast, the Gulf Coast of Florida, and putting the Panhandle and possibly other areas in the Gulf in jeopardy. This morning and in the overnight runs, They've pushed significantly farther off towards the east. The latest National Hurricane Center track goes right middle of the road, putting it along the eastern coast of Florida, reemerging into open waters, very warm waters along the Gulf Stream here at a Category 3, still a major hurricane, likely further strengthening if it was to make some sort of landfall in the Carolinas as we get towards early next week. So we talked about those winds in excess of 157 miles per hour. In fact, stronger than 185 sustained. So that puts it at the highest end on the Saffir Simpson scale at a category five does not go higher than that category one to category five and is likely going to stay that course right through the next couple of days. Now we also talked about those wind gusts being up to 225 miles per hour. That was found in the Hurricane Hunter aircraft just before it made landfall in Barbuda early this morning. Had gusts there of 199, 100 feet up, 500 feet up. They measured a wind gust of 226. That was in the northeast quadrant of the storm. You're always going to find the strongest winds in that quadrant because it factors in the storm momentum or the direction and the speed at which it's moving. So you have the strong winds and then you add in maybe that 15, 20 mile an hour forward movement and you have even stronger winds and stronger gusts there. All right, here's how it looks on the infrared radar. This is a filter on the radar that lets us see the storm at night and also picks up on the temperatures of the clouds. The white clouds that you're seeing here are very, very high cold top clouds. So that means the thunderstorm activity completely encompasses the eye wall there. And as it's moving off towards the uh, west, not really going to lose a whole lot of that strength. Let's go through the uh, several different landfalls that it made first this morning on the tiny island of Barbuda. The eye wall moved just over the north side of the island. The strongest winds right outside that eye wall, right outside that eye in the eye wall. In fact, this is the first landfall for the system. So it went over an observation station there and before the station was blown offline. It measured a gust of 155 miles per hour. So that's some good information. First ground level measurement outside of using an aircraft or satellites confirming those wind gusts in excess of 150 miles per hour. And that wasn't even in the northeast quadrant either. Then we had a secondary landfall here over St. Martin and Anguilla earlier this morning as well. Really a direct hit. Folks that were waking up there that had to deal with first the front end of the storm, you went out in the middle of the eye wall and you could see the sun shining. Skies clear out and the winds calm down. Eye walls about, or the eye itself is about 25 miles wide. So they had about 20 minutes of calm weather for the back end, which is just as strong winds rolled on through there now, just catastrophic damage. And right now it's rolling on through the British Virgin Islands, the third landfall of the day, and just going on a rampage through here, bringing very destructive winds and those gusts again, upwards of 200 miles per hour if you're located in that northeast quadrant. Here's how it looks on visible satellite imagery, a very impressive textbook looking hurricane. And we get a closer look of that eye, put a measurement on it, just over 20 miles per hour, miles per hour, 21 miles wide. So very impressive. And this has not really lost any strength at all here in the last 24 hours, even after making three separate landfalls. Usually any land interaction will cut off that fuel supply, but these being very tiny islands did not really have much of an influence there. Hurricane warnings are still up for a large swath all the way up into the Bahamas. Puerto Rico's next, but the eye passing just north of there, thankfully, but still going to be in on some of those very strong winds. All right, it's always good to know and refresh yourself on what a watch and a warning means. Watches not as urgent. They indicate the risk of hazardous weather within 48 hours. We had some hurricane watches out earlier. There are still some out there. That means it's coming in the next 48 hours or the possibilities there. A warning much more urgent that the event is occurring, imminent, or is likely. This is usually issued about 36 hours in advance to give you fair warning. Now I want to preface this graphic here. We're going to talk about storm surge because now that it's made landfall, you're going to hear more of that in the news there and storm surge levels. 
This is just for demonstration purposes. This is not where the storm is moving. This is just a demonstration graphic, okay? So here's what happens in terms of storm surge. When a storm really gets cranking, the forward momentum and the sustained winds, in the case of Irma, 180 miles an hour, that's constantly blowing on the ocean surface, piling up the water, and eventually when it interacts with a coastline, all of that water floods on shore. Yet couple that with a high tide, and this gets monumentally worse. So we're looking at storm surge levels out in those islands that it hit 10, 11, 12 feet. The good news that's in their favor is that a lot of those islands are very mountainous in the center. So you're just looking at those storm surges right in the coastline, which is unfortunately where a lot of the resort areas are there. The geologic processes that formed these islands was actually tectonic plates running into one another. So there are very high elevations in the center of those islands there. Some though, as you get towards the Bahamas, not the case. All right, what's working in the favor of Irma, continuing to keep its strength and maybe even intensifying a little bit more, is it's moving into some of the warmest waters in the Atlantic. Look at some of these numbers here at temperatures. Water temperature of 89 as you get just offshore of Nassau in the Bahamas. It's moving into bath water here, and that is just a huge amount of energy for this storm to really capitalize on. Here's how it looks here. Let's talk models now. We talked to the GFS and the European, both trending along the east coast now of Florida. Let's look at the ensemble plots, because this is one model, the GFS, that runs the same model dozens of times with different initializations, so different wind speeds, if it's moving a little bit slower, a little bit faster. Notice as we get out towards uh, middle of next week, that spread's still very, very large, about 700 miles wide, but it does lean distinctly farther to the east here. In fact, the average taking it right up into the uh, South Carolina, North Carolina line. Just one model though, so keep that in mind and things can certainly change. Here's a run of all the tropical models run together, and that's also showing a very distinct uh, change off towards the east. Even offshore of the east coast of Florida over open waters, meaning the intensity wouldn't be dropped if it doesn't make a landfall in southern Florida. To add things to this, we have not one more, but two more named storms. Jose, which is right on the heels of Irma, and then way out in the Gulf of Mexico, which is not going to be an issue to, to many folks, is Katia, also a tropical storm. Jose expected to become a hurricane as it's moving in the very warm waters right behind Irma. And that leads to the issue, you know, can these storms, you know, combine and become some sort of major system? Well, you know, although it's very unlikely and very rare, it is possible. It's something called the Fujiwara effect. In fact, earlier in July, we were watching for this to possibly happen with Irwin and Hillary. That were two hurricanes out in the Pacific. They never actually ended up combining into one, but it is possible. What happens is when they get into a certain distance away from one another, they have to be both hurricanes, but not the same intensity. One has to be stronger than the other. They get close to one another, they influence each other, and they start doing a little dance. They start orbiting around a central point, and eventually the stronger of the two storms will absorb the other, essentially becoming a strong superstorm, if you want to say that, but it hasn't really happened uh, in recent memory. So that's some good news there. Jose should not be doing this with uh, Irma. Also, we watched this last year with Matthew and Nicole, if you remember that scenario there. All right, that's all I got to say here. That's your latest update on Irma. We'll have another video tomorrow. Really appreciate you watching. Join the conversation. Find me on Facebook. Meteorologist Tim Pandages, also on Twitter, 13 Tim Pandages. Have a good afternoon.